there has to be a high level of importance to wanting to change. And there has to be an, a level of importance around the urgency to change or a recognition or connection with the cost of not changing or not growing. everyone and welcome to the Miranda Ayim podcast. I'm Miranda Ayim, a two-time Olympian with Team Canada and right now I am with Team Canada in Tampa, Florida training ahead of the Olympics. So for those who are joining me on YouTube, you can see a little bit of the mix-up with the background. Today I'm joined by Jason Seely, a performance coaching consultant and director of Seely Coaching and Performance, who consults with a wide variety of organizations such as the Smith School of Business, Queen's University, the Reach Alliance at University of Toronto, Loblaw, NAD Canada, and many more. He also teaches leadership and organizational behavior at Humber College. In this episode, we discuss leveraging mindfulness to improve performance, the key areas and issues leaders need to lean into, and the power of teams. Jason also discusses an experience he had with failure and what he learned from it. If you're looking to take your leadership or performance to the next level, this conversation is for you. The Miranda IEM podcast is all about having engaging, long-form discussion on topics that matter. So I'd love to hear from you guys, from what you think, what you like, what you'd like to hear more of. Feel free to leave a comment or reach out to me on social media, whether it's Twitter, Instagram, or at my email at mirandayim.com. I'd love to hear from you. Now let's get into the discussion. All right. Hi, Jason. How are you? Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Miranda. I'm, I'm doing great. Uh, I am stoked to be on the Miranda Ayim podcast. So looking forward to the conversation today. I am so excited to chat with you. Uh, we've been wanting to do this for a little while and finally our, our schedules aligned. So I was able to, to book myself into your calendar and thank you so much for being gracious enough to, to find the time for me. Um, I'm excited for this conversation. I'm sure people will really find some value in it. So for those who don't know you, who don't have the pleasure of knowing you, could you give us a bit of a background on who you are, uh, where you're from, and how you came to be where you are today? Wow. Okay. <clears throat> That's a big question. Well, mm -hmm. as Miranda, as you said, I'm, I'm, my name is Jason Seely. I'm, I'm in Toronto. Um, and I'm born and raised in Toronto, grew up in Toronto. Um, I, boy, I come from the world of, I guess I come from the world of sport. Um, I've, I've taken a lot of, I've, my journey has meandered a little bit. Uh, I started out in actually in business and in, in, in public affairs, working in insurance companies and things like that. And, and then uh, had a, had a, a moment uh, of reflection with myself at one point in life where I decided, you know what, I don't love this, uh, this world of business. What do I love? And decided to reconnect with my passions, which were one of them was around sport. And at the time I started also uh, coaching, coaching basketball in particular. And uh, yeah, I started, you know, people start to invite you to coach different teams. And a friend of mine said, you know, we're, we're starting this basketball program in or I want to start this basketball program in Toronto, um, coaching these young women, uh, young women were, uh, at the heart in the Harbor front area of Toronto. We're looking for a basketball program, all the boys, there were programs for all the boys, but nothing for the girls. So we started this basketball program called girl ball. And it was really like the basketball was like a vehicle to support like the social emotional development, the, the life skills development, if you will, mindset. And we did a great job um, in that sense. I think that's where I first met, you know, one of your teammates, Nayo Rinkaka mm -hmm. Um, But where I think where we weren't great is we weren't necessarily great at that time at the technical tactical part of the game. So it took, took a year off from that and went to mentor with a couple of coaches uh, at the university level. And that's when I also got uh, connected with Canada basketball for the first time and connected with, you know, uh, Mike McKay and one of your former hosts on your show, uh, Sefu Bernard. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it was interesting in, you know, those connections with the university coaches and then people like Mike and, and Seth, they just really had this language around um, supporting uh, connection and collaboration, but also clarity on, you know, 
leadership development and what leaders did and, and then how we could how we could bring the best out of people. And that really super resonated with me. So uh, I did a master's in leadership studies um, and uh, started applying my, my learnings on a team I was coaching. That team I, I met, that's where I met Sammy Hill, another one of your, your uh, teammates. And, um, um, you know, just supported a group of young people to be their personal best, um, learn to be leaders in, in, in their environments. Uh, but also produce success and then decided, you know what, I think this is what I want to do uh, for a living and got into the executive coaching world, got into the teaching of leadership and organizational behavior, got into the team coaching world. And that's where I am now. I'm, a, I'm the director for an organization called Sealy Coaching and Performance, uh, where we support leaders and teams to accelerate growth, become the best at getting better, um, you know, to produce results, but also to support, you know, their, their growth. So that's where we're at now. Um, and it's been a journey, but it's been an amazing one. And, um, yeah, look forward to continuing to grow along the path of that journey. Mm -hmm. I love your story because I'm sure in the moment it, it felt a bit like a random journey through, every new event that came into your your life with the coaching and then going into kind of delving really into that from that business field and then we're we're coming into a different type of coaching um but from a bit of a uh, a step back it it all makes sense and it all weaves together and i think some of your strengths now are because you have such a solid um, foundation in that sports world. I know you use a lot of analogies between the sports world and you bring that into the business world. And it makes so much sense because there's so much overlap between the, the sports and business world. And I will, I will definitely, I want to ask you some questions about that, the commonalities sure. between the two. But first, I remember a story that you told me that seemed to be kind of a eureka moment in your life um, when you were with one of your teams. I don't know if it was the girl ball team or if it was one of your, your other teams and you won a championship and then you had a reaction. I won't give it away, I'll let you tell it, but walk us <laughs> sure, through that. Sure, sure. So this was our, our North Toronto team. This was the team that Sammy was on. I'd been with those young ladies for about, I think it was six seasons and, and we, it was interesting just about like talking about leadership development. I think at that time I was very clear on two things. One, I had this incredible belief in the people we were working with. Mm -hmm. And two, um, I realized that we weren't necessarily the most athletic team or um, maybe even you know, the, the most skilled team, although we worked on our athleticism and we worked on our skills and technical tactical all the time. Um, but I, I really, from a, maybe I brought in a business perspective where I was like, you know, what's our differentiated value or what's, you know, what is it that we bring that others don't? And I thought, you know what, I think our differentiated value could be how we collaborate and our teamwork. And I think I'd read this quote that, you know, talent wins games and teamwork wins championships. So I was like, that's going to be us. So fast forward, coach these young ladies and um, they were great at taking it all in and the leadership lessons and it was like a it was like a CP or Canada Basketball Center for Performance session where we like before practice we would always have these little connection activities, um, we would have these little breakouts and like little workshopping as part of our regular practice. Anyway, we get to our our sixth season after knocking on the door of winning a provincial championships for several years, and we go through a tough season, but we get to the finals and we win the championship you would know what this feeling feels like you just you're just coming off of a championship and everyone's going crazy and this was like this was built up for six years right like we were knocking on the door for a while the parents are going crazy the athletes are going crazy and i remember i can still see it i was just watching everyone and and i felt underwhelmed actually mm -hmm. Um, first of all, I was exhausted, <laughs> but second, second, I, I felt underwhelmed. And what I realized it was that weeks before I felt like we had our championship. I felt like as coaches, we had supported the young people on, their, on our team to become their best on the court and off the court. I felt like if the season ended, you know, three or four weeks before we could have felt 
like we'd been successful. We could have felt so proud of how we'd supported these young people to become the best at getting better. Um, so when we got to the championship, yeah, we won, but I guess I'd already felt like we'd supported these young people to be their best. And I was underwhelmed by the win. And that gave, that was a point of clarity for me where it was like, I think this is, this is what you love about sport. You love to support, use sport as, as a vehicle to support people, to learn about themselves, learn about their strengths, uh, learn about the differentiated value that they bring to different uh, experiences uh, so that they can lead themselves, but they can also create environments to support others to be their best. So that was definitely a eureka moment. And, and, and uh, yeah, that, that moment really supported me to double down, if you will, on, on the path that I was on as it related to sort of leadership development. Mm -hmm. Those aha moments are so illuminating in our life, I find. And the fact that you were able to even identify that, okay, yes, you had the the feeling of underwhelm, but to identify that that feeling of success happened weeks in advance or months in advance, um, I think we, we sometimes miss that when we're not really clear on our values and we're not really clear on what success really actually means to us. Mm -hmm. I, I had a similar feeling, not a similar feeling, but a, an adjacent feeling after this recent um, a championship in France really? when we just we we won the league and it was just an incredible feeling just and incredible as, as well because it was um unexpected to a certain extent uh we were ranked third in the league um very close to being second and first the the margin was not very far so it's not like we were a big underdog but still our goal at the beginning of the season um, collectively um, wasn't to win the championship. I think as the season unveiled itself, we did want to be in the top four. We thought that was a realistic goal for us. Me personally, my goal coming into the season, and remember at that time, COVID was still right at its height. Um, my goal coming into the season was, you know what, enjoy. Um, be present in every moment, play to your best ability and encourage those around you. So everything else from that stance um, was bonus. And it's not a very common sport, high achieving type of goal that we, we set for ourselves. But in that situation, and also I, it was my final year playing. So I had different uh, objectives as well. Um, I knew this was going to be my last year on the, the court. So I had other things that I wanted to achieve as well. Um, so having that sense of, you know, dealing with uncertainty, um, giving the best that we had to each other and working through a lot of trials and ups and downs through the season, um, that really was our win, similar to you guys. Um, it happened way before the championships. It happened actually at a, in a more visible sense in the semis in the uh, final four because we beat a big team that no one expected us to to beat um, and that was an incredible moment and we're like yes we're going to the finals and if we can win hurrah you know <laughs> and then we went into the finals and we put together two back-to-back -to -back great team defensive wins um, and those who know sport know that it's difficult to put two great games together and two big team wins together, not just like one person having a breakout game and then, you know, a couple other people, both games, everybody on the scoreboard won, which is, a, sorry, scored, which is an incredible spread. Um, so it's those small details that really win championships. Like you said, that teamwork that wins championships is not individual play, it's different values and integrity and hard work that you kind of put into it. I got carried away with that and relieving those those <laughs> moments. But uh, I mean, I guess that's what sports does to you. Yeah, I mean, I love I love hearing what you're saying. And there's two things that I'm pulling out of that, that I, I really, really spend a lot of time on now working with uh, executive clients. One is um, awareness. And, and I know in your, in your podcast and other episodes, I've heard you speak of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, in the corporate world, sometimes we use the language mindfulness. You know, I remember your, your, your meeting with, uh, with Stu. Stu had some different titles for it as well. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's, uh, it's just awareness. Sometimes it's noticing. Um, and it get, really just depends on the client's connection with that. But I think just practicing the skill of noticing, right? Noticing um, what you're saying to yourself, noticing what you're feeling emotionally, noticing what you're feeling physiologically can help you to connect with, ooh, you know what? I really enjoyed that. And not enjoyed it from a, a hedonic pleasure kind of perspective, but ooh, that that hit me in the meaning, like in the meaning mm -hmm. spot, you know what I mean? Or in the purpose I like that. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so that's, that was, that was one thing. I think that that awareness is super important. And then the, the other thing that you'd mentioned, like that you'd come into the season, you and your team had come into the season clear on, look, you had, you would come in clear on, this is how I want to show up, right? This is what's important to me this season. And then clearly your team had created some, some, some clarity on that as well. And that's another thing we, I, you know, we work on, we focus on working on with, with executives is once they're aware and noticing that they have the ability to anchor back into their personal philosophy. And if you, if you use um, my, uh, Mike Gervais, we'll use the language personal philosophy. Uh, Ray Dalio says principles. Um, you know, I'll use, I'll, use, I'll use the term mindset, whatever it is for you, um, that you have some roots and an anchor to tap back into. That, so you can navigate some of the storm, right? You can navigate the tough parts. You can navigate when you're in that game, when you're like, oh my gosh, we're playing against this tough team and we're down 10. Like, how do you want to show up? How do you want to lose the game? Like, how do you want to go up by losing the game? Do you want to, you know, do you want to react to what's going on right now? Or is there something that you can reconnect to that resets you? So you can be like, okay, we're good. This is how I decided that I want to come into this thing. This is how I decide I want to go out. This is how I'm going to show up. And let's let the process take care of the outcome. Um, so yeah, when you mentioned that, I was just like, oh, that's, that's such an analogy for, you know, the journey that we take executives on. Mm -hmm. 100%. For those who are coming to this idea of awareness, mentality, um, just noticing and trying to build a, a personal philosophy or trying to tap into a higher state of, you know, consistency, um, a higher plane of performance and just being a human being. Um, how do you take those, your clients, for example, through that process? What's the first step in kind of opening and propping open that door to a awareness? Mm. Good question. Um, I mean, I think the first step is supporting a client to get clear on like what will success look like? Um, or another way of framing that is like, what's the problem we're trying to solve? Um, you know, um, but really just having a clear image of what is it that this person is going to be able to do better down the road uh, after we've worked together. And then also tapping into like, why is this important? And what's the urgency around it, right? Like those are in our clarity calls with clients, especially where I'm at now in, in our practice, we're really, um, we're looking for high performers. We're looking for people we know are going to get after it. Um, and as such, there has to be a high level of importance to wanting to change. And there has to be an, a level of importance around the urgency to change or a recognition or connection with the cost of not changing or not growing. Um, and then um, from there, it's, it's usually a practice in starting to develop their personal philosophy, as we call it. So helping them to get clear on how they want to show up and also helping them to build a practice around what we can all just call mindfulness for this conversation. Um, and we all, we'll, we'll always work with clients at where they're at with their mindfulness. So some, you know, some people go walk their dogs in the morning and that's their quiet time to, um, and that's when they're aware, really aware of, you know, just what's going on outside of them. They're hearing the birds chirping. Um, they smell the morning air, they're feeling the, the, you know, the, the breeze against their face. They're really in tune with like their heartbeat, you know, how they're feeling that day, but their mind is kind of quiet. Um, like from that to, um, you know, people who have an active practice in, in meditation, let's say. Um, but we leverage whatever they're using. And that's where a bit of the positive psychology comes in where it's like, okay, what works for you? So we're not, we're not saying you have to sit in lotus position for, you know, 30 minutes a day and, and, and all that. Um, but we want 
something, want to connect into something that already works for you as far as your awareness. And then, I mean, the long way of it, long story of it is that it's about supporting leaders to, it becomes about supporting leaders to become aware in the moments of what, of the data that they're receiving from, you know, their body. And, and oftentimes it's, you know, there's a way that leaders want to show up first, so actually oftentimes leaders are not clear on how they want to show up. So that's where we start. And then we create that foundation and then it becomes, okay, how do you help them to show up that way in the moment? And, you know, pulling some things from your conversation with Stu, Stu mentioned that I'm speaking about Stu, like we're buddies, <laughs> Stu Singer, I should say, uh, <laughs> said that, you know, we're not always in the zone, right? Like we kind of float in and out of the zone. So uh, supporting leaders to understand like, what are the spaces where you're in the zone where, you know, you, you just perform so well in those spaces and what are the spaces where you get tripped up and there are usually some triggers there's usually some things we're noticing in that in that space like oh you know i'm in this meeting in with these senior directors and i haven't said anything you know i'm starting to feel a bit of an imposter syndrome being in this environment or we notice after the fact you know a, a, a deliverable with our with our team that we lead um, wasn't successful after the fact and way after the fact, you know, we were kind of reflect on it. We're like, oh man, you know, I should have done this at that time. So we are really trying to bring that awareness to the moment so they can start to notice in the moment. Oh, there's that feeling of emotion. There's that physiological feeling. There's, here, there's that message I'm saying to myself and then for them to reset themselves and reconnect with their personal philosophy um, so that they can show up the way they want to show up for their people. Um, so I think if we're talking about early steps, those are, those would be the early steps. So building out the foundation of the personal philosophy and then starting to build a practice of, um, their awareness or their, their mindfulness. Mm -hmm. But let me ask you that question. Like, I mean, I know you're an experienced professional, um, but if you were working with an executive or if you were coaching someone else, a, a young athlete mm -hmm. and you wanted, um, them to just get on the mental path, you know, the mental path, the mental journey and the first few steps of the mental path, like, well, what would, how would you support them? I think you 100% nailed it on the head with this awareness piece. Um, I think I would, would go that route with athletes even before I, I talked about their, their personal philosophy and their idea of success with, success, which I think is, is tantamount. Um, but especially us as athletes, we live inside of our bodies. This is our instrument, our tool. Um, so normally we should be, have some sort of in tune, intuitive nature with our body. And I think that's a nice gateway into awareness, um, to, to have that physiological feedback and link that with our emotional state and link that with our mental state because I find that almost all of our blockages come not from our necessarily lack of skill because once you get to a high level, a professional level, everybody is very, very skilled and is capable to, to do what they need to do on the court. Um, it's the mental piece that takes us from good to great um, or takes us from having difficulty coping with a loss or an injury or ex whatever it is to to dealing with it on on good terms and being able to to move through that so the awareness piece about our reactions mainly in our, our and our thought processes while we're on the court um is a big big piece that i think the the best um athletes um at ev at any level uh, if you're able to tap into that, like, what am I thinking in this moment? Um, am I tight? Why am I tight? I'm tight because I think I'm going to miss this shot. I have this doubt coursing through my veins. Um, and it becomes a self-fulfilling process, um, prophecy that, okay, I, I'm doubting myself. I'm becoming tight. I'm going to miss this shot. And in fact, I do miss this shot because I am doubting myself. It's mm -hmm. just a vicious mm -hmm. cycle. And the sooner that we're able to recognize that that's going on, because we often don't even recognize that it's happening, um, to, to make a bit of a pause. And this is why mindfulness um, 
enables us to, to do a lot. And this is why taking those moments, building those into your day, maybe in the morning, um, realizing that you do have space in your day to actually breathe. Even in between split second decisions on a basketball court, you do have time to check in and then take your shot, even though it feels like there's nothing. So the more reps that you get at having this mindful awareness of making space just so that you can look into what's going on in your mind, in your body. And then the next step is following that, maybe injecting a more positive thought pattern, reframing, um, questioning those beliefs, and then see what happens. We might mm -hmm. have to adjust the next time. We might need to build on it. You're not going to, it's not going to go in every time just because you've um, addressed this problem with a possible solution doesn't mean you're going to score every time. And that's a mm -hmm. frustrating process for athletes, but this is part of life. There's so many things going on at one time, but yeah, tapping into that awareness first at a physiological level, then at an emotional level, and then at a mental level, I think is an incredible way for athletes and um, people, individuals who are, who are trying to, to tap into this state for sure. Mm. Good stuff, good stuff. Mm -hmm. So you have, and you still kind of uh, have this parallel between sport and business in your life, because I know that you are still in the, the sport world, you still coach athletically. Well, uh, maybe a little bit less these days with, with COVID. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. And then you also coach at, in your executive um, coaching business as well. And now you coach as well with teams. Mm -hmm. What is this difference between this individual um, coaching one-on-one -on -one and then transferring that into the team environment, because I know now you have your own team that you manage with the, uh, with the Jason C, um, your, your own company and um, how you, I know you've written somewhere that you've been able to practice what you preach and put all those best practices into to what you do. And I've witnessed it and you, you nail it every time. And um, so, yeah, tell us a little bit about this, this team dynamics, team coaching world. Yeah, I don't know if we nail it every time, but um, I think <laughs> like some of the good coaches I've been around, we're always trying, right? We're always, we're, we're, we're committed to trying to become the best at getting better. So, um, yeah, I would almost say it's interesting. I think we started out in the executive coaching world and then got into the team coaching space. And now I would say, like this team coaching space is actually probably the center of our universe. And the executives that we work with are people who are, um, who, who have gone, a lot of them have gone from being MVP to coach, if you will. Like they're yeah. the most valuable performer gotcha. in their organization. They've been promoted, promoted, promoted. And now they've got a team mm -hmm. um, of people that they lead. And now it's like, okay, do you, you're not allowed to step onto the court to shoot shots anymore. Like think about Lisa, running onto the court and snatching the ball from you or from, from Kia and, and saying, no, I'm going to score it. No, 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 you don't get to do that anymore. Now you're leading a team of people on the court. So you have to create that environment that fosters high performance. So uh, we're working with a lot of those leaders and some of them not all, aren't all new leaders. Some of them have been in leadership positions for a long time, but you know, sometimes they just get an aha moment where they're like, oh, you know what? We're not, we have all these resources, but we're not really being effective. We're not being efficient. Um, so we're working with, uh, those leaders, we're working with the performers on teams because, you know, teams are made up of performers and individuals. So just like your, your, your national team, there's a team of performers. So we're working with performers, uh, to support them to become the best at getting better and accelerate their growth so they can be, you know, more engaged performers and more committed performers. Uh, but then as it relates to the team coaching part of things, we're just, we're kind of plugging into this concept of um, the power of teams, if you will. A lot of literature for a long time on the power of teams and how, you know, um, there's this benefit of working on a team that is better than the sum of the parts of the individuals in a group, if you will. Um, what the research also shows us is that that power of teams, most teams only realize that about 20% of the time or 20, only 20% 20 of teams actually realize that power of teams, right? So that gives us like 80% of the time where we're not plugging into the power of teams. 
So and for a lot of different reasons, which I'm not going to really get into, but um, so that's the problem that we're trying to solve with the team coaching side of things, which is, you know, how do we get to a high performing place where, where teams can be benefiting from the power of teams? And in my experience working with the Smith School of Business at Queen's University and with the Reach Alliance uh, through, through U of T and, and their partner institutions uh, and sport and, you know, our, our team at Ryerson and, you know, my son's team that I coach and, you know, the team I coach with Sammy and all this kind of stuff. Um, team, being on a team can really suck. Like, you know, it's funny, we'll do a, uh, with the, with the sort of in the academic space where we're supporting sort of um, experiential learning and teaming and capstone projects. One of the questions I'll ask people after sort of an opening session is just, you know, give me your thoughts on your team. And it's either one of two ways the conversation will go. Their thought is either relief or they're communicating to me an issue that they have. But think about that relief what is what the you, what is the relief around what is the relief i'm on a team with every everybody takes responsibility everybody shows initiative people are seem to all be here for the same reasons like a like surprise it, right because they were expecting it to be a disaster mm -hmm. because going back to previous experiences they you know most of their team experiences have been an experience where like not everyone was contributing right? Or you really had to try to find ways to engage people or just like a number of different problems. So it really points to the fact that most people have like negative team experiences. Mm -hmm. So um, we essentially just build this operating system that we're able to latch on to experiential learning or um, capstone projects in the academic spaces. And just giving the team members a roadmap to be successful as t in a team part of things. So their programs will give them what success looks like as it relates to like a deliverable, so a project they're working on, but no one ever gives them a roadmap for how to work effectively together. Um, there was a, I, there was the, it was the dean for the business school at George Brown College in Toronto. His name is Dr. Ian Austin, and heard him speak recently, and he hit the nail on the head. He said, you know, we're we're having problems. We're putting our our graduates out into the business world, and their employers are coming back to us and saying, you know, your graduates aren't able to solve problems. And think of it. So someone goes through like an accounting program or a law program or something like that. They're very good at the technical side of things, but, but where they struggle is solving complex problems. So inherent in a complex problem probably means that you or I are on our own are not able to solve it on our own. So it requires a level of competence or even mastery at extracting the ag or aggregating the knowledge and the insights of other people who are working with you so that you can all address a complex problem together. And without, without those skills, you know, these educational institutions are starting to understand without those skills, we're putting people out into the workplace without the skills to be successful in today's work environment where there is so much collaboration and where you are being asked to solve complex problems. <clears throat> so that's where we come in. We come in to solve, to solve and address that problem by giving these teams an operating system. So I would say now that's the, that's the core of the business. And then, um, you know, but with that, we're also working with leaders who want to create that environment for their team. And we're working with, you know, their people who are in that environment who just want to be their best because they want to be, you know, great team members. So. That's, uh, I think those are sort of like the three levels of the business right now. I so relate to their, their feeling of potential relief or surprise when you enter a team that is functioning and healthy and successful, um, whatever that looks like for the team, because it's so true. Like teams are necessary, yet at the same time, so many, so many of us kind of hate being in teams or we dread working together or we don't know how to work together it's kind of like makes me think of you know you go to school for so many years and you get out and you have to pay your taxes and you're like nobody told me how to do this this is an essential life skill and nobody bothered to teach this to me um yeah. and i feel like in the same way 
um, working within a team is something that we just kind of have to fumble along and, and learn through trial and error. Um, thankfully, you and I have been put into many, many team environments in the sports world. You have to learn how to, to get along. And if you don't, um, it can really hurt your chances of being kept on the team, even if you are skilled enough to be there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an in incredible life skill to have, especially at the top, top levels when you can't do it all. You have to rely on others, on big projects, whatever it is. Um, so I think it's incredible um, what you guys are doing with your um, specific business, um, as well as with the Reach Alliance that I know you work with, which is integrating that exact process into student development while they're still in, in, in school. So they don't have to have that graduating um, <laughs> moment where they're like, ah, I actually don't have the life skills to, to <laughs> jump into this job or, or go into the next thing. Well, well, and you, you hit on something that I think has become the, the, the modus operandi for how we develop teams. It's, you know, put a whole bunch of people together, give them something, give them a deliverable and let them have at it and hope somehow that they figure out how to become better at collaborating. And what the research is showing is, you know, they're not figuring that out. They're figuring out, uh, I don't want to work on teams you know, uh, again, mm -hmm. or they're figuring out, well, this is like a team I had before, so I'm just going to do all the work. Or this is like a team I had before, and I'm not going to do any of the work. Mm -hmm. and, and then touching on what you mentioned about our shared experience in sport, you know, one of the things that sport has that's unique to some of these other situations is, is like, you know, winning, right? Like, people want to win. At least in, in the sport environment, people want to win. And they don't just want to win games. People want to win championships. And, you know, I've, I've been blessed, really blessed to work with uh, so many people, so many coaches who have had that, that hunger and that desire, but have really been so curious and creative about, well, how do we create the environment so that we can get to winning a championship? Mm -hmm. And that's it. Like, if I want to win the championship and you have as much talent on your team as I have on my team, what is it that I'm going to do differently than you to get the edge? Mm -hmm. Right? So it's like, it becomes that well, I'm not just going to hope that these, these people figure out how to work effectively together. I'm going to study it and I'm going to learn like, what are, like, what's the, what's the blueprint of, of effective teams and, and, and then support my team to, to create that environment or give them that blueprint and then let them make it their own. And, but it's all, I think you only have that if winning is something that you're, that you're, you're focused on. And sometimes we ask clients that all the time, like, you know, like, do you want to win? Like we'll ask that question straight up. Like when, when people get lost in the fog and wanting to win means like reconnecting them with their, how they want to show up or what success looks like for them. Exactly. But it's like, well, if you want to win, then, you know, these are things that, that need to get done. So you're absolutely right. Like people have poor experiences. People just jam together and expect it to figure it out. And, but the sport world has a lot of things figured out that the business world could really benefit from, um, from, you know, the whole idea of wanting to win to getting like KPIs and, or getting sort of data back so quickly. Like you have multiple games in a season. You don't wait till the end of the year to say, geez, was that a good season or not? Like what, after a game, you're getting your stats back and you're like, you know, how do we perform in relation to our KPIs? And it gives you this feedback as a team where you can now start to modify the things where the areas where you're, you're not successful and or you can start to build on certain areas of strength as well. In the business world, it's not always so, you're not getting that data back so quickly and you know, everybody being aligned on the same goal is not always the same. So there's so many best practices from sport that we bring to the business world and we paint those pictures from, this is what it looks like in the sport world. You know? Yeah, it's so true. In the sport world, the, the North Star or the, the ideal ending point of the season is very clear. To, to win the championship, ideally. And, and that is not a sprint, it's a marathon. 
And that's why it's so important to build that foundation and, and know those, those value points of, of feedback into what you are actually building towards. Um, because the short-term solution is not going to be the long-term solution. And you will only know that if you know the final goal, if you know what and who you want to, to be and be building towards. And um, I find, I can understand how that would be really difficult in the business um, sphere because even in the sport world yes people have their individual goals their their own agendas they they want playing time they want to get their stats they they want to be to to sign for the next season and get a better salary or whatever it is um but people still do have that goal team goal that they're they're building towards um but in the business world like i don't think the individual worker is like yeah i want to make this business profitable you know i don't think that is their their goal or whatever their deliverable of um the company's um clear goal or vision of success is and that's why i love when uh, companies don't just you know do their their little few lines of we are a company that values blah, 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 but actually sitting down and working through it with their team and thinking like, this is actually what we stand for. This is actually what we're working towards. Yes, we are um, working towards being a profitable company so that we can do this, provide this for this community or improve the, the usability of this product. And I think um, just being clear about that in the, the business community and with teams as well um, provides that that meaning point that that a purpose um, touches the purpose spot as you you said earlier. Um, mm -hmm. I, I like that because we are human beings we need meaning we need purpose, even if it's a job that we wouldn't always think that this would be um the the end all where we where we get our meaning but if we have this collective meaning we we do work so incredibly um well together yeah and and you know i'm probably painting doing a bad job in, in the sense i'm probably i'm painting the business world all with one brush mm -hmm. i think um you know there are a lot of leaders who are taking these best practices that we that you and I would would take for granted almost We're like okay this is what this is what a team experience looks like this is what pursuing a goal together and producing results and growth looks like um, there are a lot of leaders who are trying to make sure that their organizational values are lived and breathed and not mm. just written on paper somewhere yeah that they're putting these values into action that they're not just you know um, they're not just the uh, things that are written and are externally facing as part of the marketing or the branding of the organization, but they're also internally facing. Um, but even, I think even with those organizations, it's like, okay, how do we bring those things to life? Or those, those leaders, how do we bring those things to life? How do we make them more actionable? Um, and then there's a lot of organizations who just, who just haven't gotten clear on those things. And then now, you know, especially in the last year with, you know, I'm only going to cite one reference point, but like the, the murder of George Floyd, mm -hmm. you're, you're seeing a need to shift and be cognizant and connected to uh, the experience of a diverse working community and, 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 and diversity on teams and honoring the different experiences and the different intersectionality of people that you're working with. Um, and you know, a lot of a lot of leaders right now are struggling with that. A lot of leaders are struggling to um, have the conversations and have create the space to better understand the needs of those they serve. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of leaders are struggling to be vulnerable enough to communicate that, like you know, they're uncomfortable with these conversations or they don't have the answers and. I'm going to shout out again, one of your staff, um, Carly Clark, some who I work with at Ryerson University. She's our head women's basketball coach. And, um, you know, a year ago, I think, you know, a year ago from today, um, we had a team meeting and this was, you know, driven by Carly, um, where it was just, listen, 
you know, these black men are getting killed and getting murdered and uh, by police. And, you know, I can see how upsetting this is for people and just want to create a forum where we can get together and talk about this and you can say whatever you want to say. Um, so we had, you know, I don't know how many people from our team, but a good amount of people from our team. And Carly starts the conversation out by saying, listen, this wasn't my idea. Uh, Jess, our assistant coach, um, uh, thought, said, you know, we need to do this. And Carly says to the team, listen, I got to be honest with you. I don't have all the words. I don't understand all of what's going on. And she, my, she says, my, you know, and it makes me feel uncomfortable sometimes to have these discussions. And my reflex is that when I'm uncomfortable about things, I, I, I sort of shy away from them. Um, so she was like, I want us to have this forum, one, so I can learn, uh, but two, to challenge my comfort zone, to stretch my comfort zone, because I know how important this is for me to be the best leader that, that I am. Like, it was such a moment, I'm getting emotional as I'm thinking about it. It was such a moment of, of communicating vulnerability. And like, I don't have all, I don't, I don't have all the answers, but I want to get it right. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, you know, part of this is, I think this is what we need to see in leadership now, where it's like, you know, I don't need to be right. I want to get it right. And, I, you know, one of the things that we'll do a lot with our clients is we bring these, these real life stories from the world of sport or other contexts that we're working in to them and say, look, this is what it looks like in action, right? It looks like a leader being vulnerable enough to say that I don't have all the answers, but I know I'm, I'm owning my responsibility as a leader. I'm trying to create a, a, an environment that fosters high performance with you all. I want to show you that I care about you as people, not, a, not in your ability, not just about your ability to perform and produce results. Um, and I'm willing to, to be vulnerable to do that. So I think in this day and age, that's a place where we could see some, it'd be beneficial to see some growth um, yeah. in, 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 in leadership. There's so many lessons from there. And Carly is an incredible human being. And I'm, I'm not surprised at all that that was her approach to that, that meeting. And again, we come back to this piece of awareness, like knowing, hey, this is my default position when I'm uncomfortable. And, you know, I'm choosing, I'm choosing in this moment to instead lean in towards that uh, uncertainty and un uncomfortability. And, um, and being, yeah, the leader that the team needs to be showing vulnerability. And, and I think more and more these days, I'm encouraged because I'm seeing more and more stories of leaders um, in whatever walk of life, um, in whatever level they are at, um, choosing to, to show a more human side because we go to work and we spend so many hours of our day um, in offices or in our workplace. And I think before we kind of separated our humanity a bit from the workplace. And like you said, weren't really recognizing each other as human beings with some, you know, we all have our strengths and weaknesses in different ways. And um, yeah, I think the, the more that we can f um, create connections um, and, and create a, a space that is um, safe for people to, to come to and communicate and work towards a, a common goal. I think we can, we can only become stronger and, and better as we continue down that road. Sure. And you, you said, you know, space, these spaces and for them to be safe enough for these types of conversations to happen, but even, you know, just safe enough for people to feel like they can bring their authentic selves to, uh, the work that they're doing. Um, because that's when we start to notice the strengths. I think there's, there's people who, you know, there's conforming, right? I come to work, I do as I'm told, right? Um, but when we get the best out of people is when they're really committed. And, and usually when they're really committed, there's, there's a part of them that they're able to show and, and bring to their work. So um, I think when we're able to create more of those types of spaces um, and, and leaders are curious about you, like all of you and what you bring to uh, the organization, um, I think it brings a different type of motivation out of their people to, you know, bring their best to the the endeavor. I agree. I like that, and I, I think it's a a 
It needs to be a collective effort, I think, as these leaders continue to create these spaces, create strong, dynamic, engaged communities. And as us as workers or people as part of the team are bringing our best self, are, are challenging ourselves also to, to get out of our comfort zone and reach also across the aisle, I think that creates a beautiful space for, for something greater than ourselves. And, and you know, we, you and I have already had many discussions about um, building into something that's, that's greater than ourselves. Again, coming back to that, that meaning point and um, building towards that. Um, I have another question that I wanted to, to ask you that I, I haven't sure. asked people in our uh, my past um, podcast, but I was recently listening to a, um, a French podcast, actually, because now that I've left France, I'm like, I'm not going to lose my French. <laughs> 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 and it's called La Leçon, un podcast sur l'art de déchouer. Do you speak French? I speak some French. So La Leçon, the lesson. Yeah. And what was the second part of it? Of the Un title? podcast sur l'art d'échouer. Yeah. So the art of failing. You nailed it. Look at you. Okay, we're going to have to start speaking in French here. <laughs> well, you can speak French. <laughs> I'll listen and I'll <laughs> And you'll listen to respond in English. That. Awesome. I love yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, basically, it is exactly what it sounds like. Um, this woman, I, I, I forget her name right now, but interviews a whole swath of different people from all walks of life, uh, different jobs, um, and basically ask them about the moment in their life where they had some sort of failure or a big lesson or, you know, just one of those kind of turning points that you look back on your life and you're like, wow, I'm, that probably hurt in the moment, mm -hmm. but I'm really glad that I, I had that experience and this is what I've learned or this is where it's brought me um two so i want to ask you that question oh. <laughs> is there a specific it doesn't have to be some huge thing this we're we're not going to overthink it but if there's something that comes to mind even recently a an error a mistake a failure or some sort of difficulty that you had that that you've mm -hmm. learned from it, like a billion of them first mm -hmm. of all yeah. um I, I think that i i i plug into the, the title of that of the the podcast right um, very intentional about failing on the road to 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 try to figure things out um, trying to figure which one I'm going to give you uh, so I, I think I want to give a really good failure uh, so I was coaching a team a business school team and um, long story short their behavior in this moment. We had, we had a, I think it was a peer review, a feedback giving exercise to do. We were, this is back in the day when we were all in person. And uh, they came really late for the, uh, for the session. And when they came to the session, they were, in my opinion, a little bit um, disrespectful and whatever. I'm not going to get too much into that. But, you know, I asked myself, I said in that moment, I said, geez, you know, if they were, if they were a sport team of mine, what would I do in this situation? And because their behavior was contrary to any of our behavioral norms, and it was just really weird. Anyway, I chose to react, chose to react, because I was really frustrated in the moment. Not that that's an excuse. And I essentially berated these business professionals and just like sort of like blasted them. Sport style. Sport style. Yeah, <laughs> react, reactive sport style. So. I, I think there's times as 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 leaders where we where we um, we can use quote unquote intimidation as a as a tool, uh, but it has to be used very intentionally, very carefully. This was not uh, this was not intentional. This was not careful. This is reaction and frustration and anger. Uh, anyway, long story short, um, I, I lost. I broke the relationship. I, I ruined the relationship between myself and these 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 people I was coaching. And we went through the motions after that point of, you know, contact points I was supposed to have with this team and how I was supposed to influence them, but I lost them all at that point. And it speaks to the importance of the relationship. Mm. Um, or, or sorry, it reiterated to me the importance of the relationship at that time that, you know, once the relationship is broken or there's something blocking the relationship, doesn't matter how good the information is that's going from point A to point B, 
from coach to person being coach, it's not going to be received or it's not going to be received uh, with the same uh, intensity. And essentially, you know, these people didn't allow me to coach them moving forward. They didn't allow me to influence them moving forward. So that was a, for me, for me, that was a big failure. One, because I thought I'd failed as their coach because it was not, I was not able to perform the, the, the job and, and execute the responsibility and, and influence this team the way I was supposed to influence them to give them the success that we had promised. But two, and maybe this is where I really hold myself very accountable, I'd let myself down, right? I, I had, instead of, I, I, I wasn't aware, like my awareness there wasn't, um, you are, you know, what are you saying to yourself? What are you feeling physiologically? What are you feeling emotionally? And then how do you want to show up? It was noticing those things and then like, ah, right? So um, I, I, I let the constituents down, but also I'd let myself down because that's not how I want to show up. So, I mean, that was a few years ago, but uh, I think I, I wanted, I'm th thankful for, thanks for asking the question, by the way. I really appreciate the question because um, one, it's true. And two, I, I love to communicate the gifts of imperfection and, and, you know, pulling, sorry, stealing that from Brene Brown. And, um, and with people that we work with, it's like, look, you know, um, it, I like to pull this, this quote from, from Maya Angelou, Dr. Maya Angelou. It's, um, you know, be your best until you do your best. Oh, do your best. And, oh yeah. Do your best until you know better. And then once you know better, do better. Yes. Yeah. I love that quote. And, and this, just this iterative process to our journey and becoming the best at getting better. So, you know, I reflected on that and now, you know, the relationship, the coaching relationship is just so important to me because of that experience. Also because of some other mentoring that I received, you know, um, I think uh, Peter Jensen has worked with your, your team at times and him and his, his organization, uh, Third Factor, it, they're, they're big on like the relationship and they call it a pipeline, a pipeline, if you will. And without the pipeline, you know, it doesn't matter how good the coaching is, it's just not gonna get to where it needs to get to. So yeah, I, I think one, I like to communicate that story because you know it's a story of that response to failure, but two, just to communicate that, like Stu Sting, Stinger said, like we go in and out of the zone, right? Like sometimes we're in flow and we're getting it right. And then sometimes oh, we, we disconnect from it and hopefully we can disconnect from it and reconnect from it without too much collateral damage or too many opportunities missed. But, you know, I think even, I think the best of leader needs to, needs to recognize when they've made mistakes. Not that I'm, not that I'm the best of leader, but um, I think those who are able to notice that's a mistake, that's a failure and, and then respond to it. Um, they just accelerate their growth. I'm reading Ray Dalio's principles now, and he just speaks about like this really intentionally about setting audacious goals, failing, developing his principles, and then setting a new goal and off you go, right? Like that's, that's his, that's his mental model. Well, that was his mental model with, with Bridgewater. And um, I think if you have that type of a model, you're able to really extract the lessons learned from those failures and then um, help them on your road to success. Yeah, yeah, that is, it's so powerful when we when we talk about that, again, coming back to this piece of vulnerability and, and owning your your moments of weakness or your your failure. And I like when you use the word iteration, because I love this word. Um, the, the more that we, we do it, the more we practice it, the more reps that we get, the more comfortable we'll get with failure. Because the first time you fail, you're like, oh, it's the end of the world. What am I going to do? It takes a hit on your ego your self-esteem and and sometimes you shrink back into that that feeling of you know okay I'm going to compress compress myself I'm not going to try that again but the more that you kind of come out of yourself and and lean to into that that state um you're like oh okay actually you know sometimes feeling sucks but I learned and each time it becomes a little bit less I think obviously an athlete mind I think of lifting weights and the first time you go after a long time of not lifting weights, you come out of the weight room and you're absolutely dead. You can't move your muscles for days afterwards. But each iteration, each time that you go in, you break down that muscle and it regenerates, makes you stronger and makes you that 
one step closer to the goal that you you want to be at, it um, it becomes less and less painful, as long as you keep keeping it up. As soon as you kind of get back into your comfort zone, you have to do that little breakthrough lesson uh, again. And I think that's a, a perfect analogy of making those mistakes. Thank you so much for for sharing that that failure and um, how you how you've learned through it. Because I think my personal um, opinion on failure and mistakes and sharing them, especially because sometimes we try to hide them. And the, the most common, there's a quote that I love, but I always forget it when I try to quote it. Um, the most, um, it's like the most common is the most, uni or the most painful or shameful is actually the most universal. Just mm. speaking to the things that we try to hide and we mm -hmm. think that we are unique and the only person that's feeling this. This is a, a signal that probably everybody is feeling this and it's a, a commonality. Sure. You know, it, as you're saying, that, it makes me think of, you know, thank goodness um, I have a certain, I had in that situation, a certain level of, for lack of a better term, privilege so that I could fail without, I mean, the consequence was uh, you know, what I was able to, the environment I was able to create for this team and how I was able to support them, but the consequence wasn't my job, right? So I, I think I'm, you know, I'm trying to become more aware of, you know, th these best practices we have around, you know, leadership development or even our team operating systems or even individual performance and, 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 and mindset. I'm trying to also become more aware and more informed and educated on the intersection of those things with, with uh, you know, different communities. And so, for instance, you know, we I think we can talk about the importance of failure in in your road to success because we know we know that it's important. Like we know about this iterative process, uh, but I'm also aware that you know, in some context, with so, some people failure is not an option. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and in some cases, some of those are the people who learn real quick because they're like, I can't afford to fail. You have no option. Yeah. You have no option. Um, but I'm also just careful not to put that story about, look, everyone's got to fail these, this amount of times on people who are like, I don't have, I, I don't have the, the privilege to fail that amount of times. So I either got to get it right the first time or to what you said, I might have to retreat and just stick with what I've got because what I've got is paying the bills right now. You know, that's not who we're working with in our practice, but but I'm just trying to become more and more aware of what's going on in the world and 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 different people's context. So yeah, just to put that on there. And there's varying levels of failure or degrees of failure as well. Like sometimes you're not going to like invest $100,000 in a business and have it tank. That's not the kind of failure that anybody is, is everybody is going to, to face. Sometimes failure is like you say hi to someone and they don't say hi back. You took a chance and you, you failed for whatever reason. Um, and, and that funnily enough, can really impact our entire day that can have an impact on how we see ourselves as a human being. So yeah, when we speak about failure or these kind of difficulties, um, sometimes we think that we have to think about this big thing, but sometimes it's just little things that we're working through on a day-to-day -day basis that is just as valid and, and, and just as significant in that person's life. Sure. Mm -hmm. So, ah, uh, Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Jason, for joining me today. I always love talking with you. We always have interesting, enlightening discussions and you're such a genuine uh, human being. Um, I think that comes across even virtually or audibly wherever people are, are listening to this. So I'm glad that my audience will have a chance to, to meet you. And is there anywhere that you want to direct people? Where can they follow you, your work online or otherwise? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll give that. But before I say that, I want to thank you for, for having me today. You've had some incredible guests. So I really do feel honored and humbled and, and, and excited. I was excited coming in today to be on, on your podcast. So thank you so much. Um, I also want to 
make sure that I'm intentional about congratulating you on your French league win. That's fantastic. And what a way to go out. I mean, your, you know, your final season and you go out as a champion. Um, yeah, just congratulations. I was so happy for you. And then right back at you as far as just, you know, authentic person. And I think you're one of the more authentic people I've met in the last few years. And it's, it's a pleasure to just share the airspace with you. And then you're on a, you're on your journey. You're on your journey to the, to the, to the gold medal. So mm -hmm. I, I want to make sure that I, I send a shout out to you and your team and your staff and wish you guys the best. You guys are such a world-class model for uh, how to get it done and how to become the best at getting better. I've learned so much from, you know, your team. Um, so I just want to, you know, make sure that I give you all my best wishes and all my energy on your journey. Thank you so much. And as far as, um, yeah, you're welcome. And then as far as uh, where people can connect, uh, right now we're rebuilding the website, but for now uh, people can go, they can connect with me at, uh, on our, my website, uh, jasonseely.com, I think it is. It's Correct, yep. I just looked at it Jason before this. Uh -huh. but, yeah, I can't remember. Um, LinkedIn right now is where we're doing a lot of uh, social media posts. Um, uh, we have an editorial calendar where we're putting out consistent stuff. So mm -hmm. LinkedIn is probably the best place to find either me, Jason Seely, or the organization Seely Coaching and Performance. Um, yeah, those would be the those would be the spots right now. Mm. And, For our future uh, listeners who may be listening to this at a later date when mm. the website is up and running, do you know the URL URL already? I would say that the URL is going to be scpteam. Okay. dot com. All right. Uh, so hopefully that's what it is. Let's see for uh, those then, future people. <laughs> absolutely. Um, and then there will probably also be um, uh, a Twitter, SCP team Twitter as well. Okay. So yes, for future, future listeners. That's right. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you again for, for coming today. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your May 2-4 weekend. Enjoy your time with your, your family and whatever else you're doing today. Yeah, and good luck in bubble life and can't wait to see you guys play and perform. Thank you so much. Thanks, Marina.